Hi everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Low Season Traveller Insider Guides. I'm your host, Jed Brown, founder of Low Season Traveller, and this week we're going west to the United States as we discover just why Texas and New Mexico should never be overlooked when considering a trip to the USA. For this first episode, we're joined by David Herzog, who's been a guide in this region for, well, many, many years. Here he tells us all about the region and outlines why it's so important in terms of its historic significance as well as its natural heritage. Enjoy. So David, welcome to the Low Season Traveller Insider Guides podcast. Wonderful to have you on the programme with us. How are you? Very well, thank you. It's, it's great to see you. Now I can see you. Just for our, our listeners who are at home all over the world and in the US indeed, uh, many of them, um, it looks like it's lovely and sunny where you are today. So uh, tell us where you are this morning. I'm in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I, uh, where I live. Lovely place. Um, uh, we've, uh, we're in the middle of our, what we call our monsoon season, but today, fortunately, it is not yet raining. So That's, that's but, my term, um, monsoon, David. Uh, that clear, <laughs> all I can see is, again, for our listeners, all I can see is a beautiful, clear blue sky. The sun is shining. And um, yeah, yeah that's, that's my kind of monsoon. We, we call it severe clear. Severe clear, my God. Yes. I've, I've never experienced it, David. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you've been to Tenerife, you've probably seen something similar. I've never, only, yeah. I've never been, I've only seen pictures. So. That's, that's yeah, very you're, true. You're, that's very true. So um, where, where you are in Santa Fe, again, for our listeners that might not be as aware, you know, we always talk, when we talk about this huge um, continent of North America, and the huge country of the United States of America. Um, a lot of our travelers, um, they're really familiar with, you know, along that East Coast, the New York, their, their understanding of Florida, of course, which is very popular with the, the UK market in particular. And they know about the West Coast, they know about California, they know about um, San Francisco, and they know about uh, Las Vegas, of course. And then we have this area in the middle, <laughs> which a lot of the, the <laughs> audience, we, you know, we, we don't know much about it, David. So tell us, just so we can be specific, what, what status is Santa Fe in? Where exactly are you? And tell us a little bit then about the significance of that region where you're located. Well, if you're familiar with all these other areas, uh, you've flown over New Mexico and presumably Texas. Um, you know, it's, it's this kind of a uh, area that's forgotten by many, an area which uh, uh, in northern New Mexico in particular, it has more in common with the with Colorado, with the Rockies. Uh, many people who've, who've uh, presumably some have been, have been to Dallas or to Houston, uh, you know, the mega cities, which uh, we will arrive on, arrive into, but uh, the main attraction is going to be uh, the southwest in particular, the, the stretch between which, you know, we're talking over a thousand miles, probably 1200 miles, uh, Spanish heritage, uh, Indian heritage in particular in uh, New Mexico, uh, largest proportion of natives in the country, uh, where natives are something, are people that you actually see, not hear about. Mm -hmm. um, beautiful ruins uh, and also current existing Indian pueblos, um, a uh, a, lot, a much a history to to rival the East Coast. In fact, uh, even prior to the uh, uh, founding of Jamestown, uh, there were Spanish already in New Mexico. We're talking 1598. Wow. You know, rivaling uh, Saint Augustine in northern Florida. For those of you who've been there. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, just a, a totally different feel from from the rest of uh, you know the, the, the tourist uh, beauty spots that you think of, you know, Florida or or California or New York. Uh, much less visited even by by Americans, you know. Although we're ha we currently are having a little bit of a spike now, which is nice after a year and four months of uh, of um, empty streets like everywhere else. Yeah. Very good. Um, it's interesting. So, you know, Texas, so from a personal point of view, I, I have been to, to Texas once um, and I was in San Antonio. Um, oh, you I, were? Oh. I will confess it, it blew me away, David. Absolutely. Yeah. 
yeah. absolutely yeah. blew me away. And it was because, um, it, probably because I didn't know what to expect. But once, yeah. once I arrived there, I just kind of was, was then left puzzled thinking, why, why aren't more people from Europe and certainly the UK, <laughs> why, why aren't they traveling to, you know, to places in Texas like, like San Antonio? Because um, it's just, it's a I, I think, I, yeah, I think it just kind of gets, uh, um, which I say overwhelmed by the more popular places. Uh, firstly, it is, it is remote even, okay, not for Texas, it's within the, the axis of Dallas and Houston, and Austin, et cetera, but, uh, still, you have to go the extra mile, and if you're, especially to Santa Fe, we are even more remote. You know, obviously, we're only a, an hour away from the larger airport in Albuquerque, but Albuquerque is a tiny little blip on the on the map of the Southwest. You know, overwhelmed by Phoenix and the Grand Canyon and and all the beauty spots in, in further to the west, but. Um, that's that's also the attraction. We don't have the mobs like mm. like the Grand Canyon does, or uh, of course the larger cities of Texas. Even San Antonio, which is uh, I think it's more than a million for sure, has the feeling of a of a small town, especially if you're in the center portion where where you presumably where the Riverwalk and the uh, mm -hmm. the beautiful missions and the the uh, you know the atmosphere is something that that you probably. I don't know if there's anything equivalent anywhere in Europe. I, I don't think there is, you know, yeah. maybe, maybe closer to rural Spain, but mm -hmm. yeah, quite something. Yeah. Well, you, you've kind of touched on this um, a little bit, um, but tell us a little bit about the immigrant trail um, and the significance of that. You know, uh, and I, I had a text from, from Susanna earlier today, uh, you know, asking about that. And, you know, the, uh, the immigrants to Texas, or the emigrants to Texas, uh, Texas is pretty much the 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 goal, the the end point. From Texas, there was very little immigrant uh, immigration further to the west. So, those who came to Texas, which would have been in the 1840s mostly, with Stephen Austin, uh, of course, the name uh, the town named after him. Uh, a lot of them came from the what is now considered the Deep South and or the, uh, the border states of Tennessee, Kentucky, um, uh, looking for land, obviously, uh, especially for those coming from Europe, uh, who would have had the almost no chance to achieve anything, uh, any, any kind of land to tend to, you know, from, from Germany, from England, from Scandinavia, uh, wherever they came from, and then first emigrating to what would be now uh, the, the the deep south and or Tennessee or Kentucky, uh, where is it even uh, uh, more fruitful? Where is the chance to have land with no restrictions even better? Well, why not Texas? Right? Uh, it, not so much uh, going towards towards California. California was still in the hands of the of the Spanish in those days, or the Mexicans, I should say. Uh, Santa Fe was was. A, a smallish, very small town, maybe only 10,000 or something at that point. So you would have had, uh, and, and still uh, Spanish speaking as to today, it is still to this day, probably half the population is still Hispanic and still speak Spanish at home. It's not the cultivated type of Spanish that you would, you know, expect from, you know, a larger city in, in Europe, of course. Uh, but but as far as emigrants to to what is now New Mexico, very limited. Most of them would have gone to the gone to the fertile, uh, the hill country, uh, which is where Susanna and I spent a lot of time. Um, uh, a little bit more temperate than the uh, plains down towards uh, San Antonio or down towards Houston or or uh, the Gulf area, which is, would be much too, much too warm. Mm -hmm. uh, area gets ample rain. Um, if anything, occasionally too much rain, <laughs> uh, but uh, large scale immigration to, to New Mexico, no, it would have been to uh, the hill country of Texas. So the area north uh, west of uh, San Antonio. And that, that, um, yeah. that immigration then, how, how has that shaped or indeed, has it? It must have shaped, I guess, the, the Texan culture, because you know when you know when, when we're in Europe, we, we tend to think of the United States as rightly so as one country, 
but we forget the the sheer mm -hmm. size of the United States of America and all of the different states. Yeah. And yeah. it is it is almost like a collection of countries at times. And and some of those states have very different cultures. What's the culture like of Texas? <laughs> and how is it shaped? Uh, you know, um, quite honestly, uh, as I'm relatively uh, rarely in, in Texas, mostly I would be uh, in New Mexico and going further west. Uh, I, I'm not actually, when you're talking about culture, you're talking about a culture in, in, that I'm relatively unfamiliar with. The, the, the part of, of Texas that I'm most comfortable with is the portion which is very much more like New Mexico, which is, yeah. is very Hispanic. Um, in many cases, what Susanna and I discovered, maybe still not speaking Spanish in the uh, rural areas to the hill country, most of the Hispanics have been acculturized, you know, they've been acculturated. Uh, those who have Spanish last names and look Spanish, it's like, they still don't, they don't speak Spanish. Once we go down closer to the border area, yes, virtually everyone is bilingual. Yeah. But um, as far as the, as far as the culture of, of um, like you mentioned, the, uh, the various parts of, of, of the states, you know, we have, oops, we have, uh, very little in common with very little in common with say New York or, or California or at least Northern California, uh, much more to do with the, the culture of the Southwest, much more to do with the, the, um, uh, which I say the, the, the uh, connections to Mexico, especially Northern Mexico, the Chihuahua and Sonora names, which maybe your clients are familiar with, uh, obviously ranching, uh, small farmers, um, you know, uh, uh, Santa Fe is a very particular spot because we happen to have this uh, kind of a, a very heavy emphasis on what you consider traditional culture, traditional European culture. We have our own opera, we have a chamber music um, festival, we have, um, you know, flamenco, obviously here, which influenced, of course, by Spain. Um, but as far as a large scale traditional um, you know, let's call them cultural events, uh, what you would have on the East Coast or West Coast, very limited in the Southwest. You know, if you go to um, uh, Southern Texas, you know, Western Texas or Southern New Mexico, that's open country, that's desert, that has very little to do with the rest of, the rest of, uh, you know, the United States, you know. Yeah. Uh, and like you say, there's, there's all these various little you know, uh, regions of the U.S., you know, the, the intermountain regions north of where uh, Susanna lives in Denver or the, um, or the upper Midwest or, or uh, you know, the, the deep south, which, you know, all different regions with very little to do with each other and uh, very little connection with the, with the, and they feel very remote from the power centers of New York or California or even, or even Houston. You know, which again is a totally different world. You know? Yeah, I think that's what makes them appealing, though, isn't it? I think you know, yeah, again, yeah. you know, we, we often hear um, a lot of people in the UK, and they sort of say, "Well, you know, you, you don't go to the US for culture," and and you know, I think, <laughs> and and that's obviously that's that's quite disingenuous, really, and it's quite it's quite incorrect. Um, but then, if yeah. they're only going to go to Las Vegas, Orlando, and um, and LA, then yeah. you know, yeah, okay, <laughs> that's probably not a fair depiction. That's that's a different type of culture. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very very different kind of culture. But I think that's why you know that's why we wanted to shine a spotlight on places like Santa Fe and like uh, San Antonio yeah. and, and sort of Texas in general is is that there is a very very different culture there, and um, that people yeah. Yeah. might not be uh, might not be aware of really, I guess. Yeah, both, you know, um, I, I can't say that there's been, uh, I mean, there's obviously indirect uh, cultural links between San Antonio and Santa Fe over the, over the, over the hundreds of years. Uh, but uh, I have to admit, I, I met quite a few people in, in the uh, San Antonio area and also in the Hill Country who've never been to Santa Fe. I mean, they're very aware of it. They know the name. They're, they're uh, you know, uh, Spanish speakers, obviously, in many cases, too. But um, for that, and it's a thousand miles away. It's not for people who live down there. You know, Americans, they obviously travel, too, but 
they travel by air, maybe to LA or to New York or to Denver, or obviously even to Houston, because even going to Houston is a four or five hour drive. For them, it's, it's uh, you know, they, they do it in a car, but, you know, it's extremely remote, all these areas for, especially for someone from Europe, you're coming in, you're, you're thinking, oh my God, you know, it's around the corner. No. <laughs> yeah. How long did it take us, Susanna? It took us, you know, three days to get home. I mean, it, wow. it, you know, <laughs> yes. You know, uh, what is it from, from Southern UK or Southern England up to the Scottish border? It's like 800 miles. We did, I think we did 1300 miles. So. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's always, it's always intriguing. You know, we, we do these podcasts um, in different parts of the world we kind of visit, but um, you know, it's like when you're talking to Australians about distances, <laughs> it's, it's just, <laughs> It's, it's like, you know, it's very hard for us to sort of fathom, I think, in, in Europe and certainly in the UK. And one of the things that I'm always sort of reminded of, you know, when, when I go to places like, you know, parts of the States, when you're out in nature, as well as in the likes of Australia, but I'm always, I'm always amazed at the skies. The skies are just yeah. big. You know, they're really big skies, which sounds I, I don't for our listeners, yeah. and they might not know yeah, what I'm yeah. talking about, but hopefully you know what I mean by that, right? You know, I, I don't want to rub it in, but, uh, you know, and, and we have had clouds the last few weeks. Fortunately, our monsoon has kicked in. And of course, nothing compared to like an Indian monsoon where you get, I don't know, thousands of millimeters or hundreds of inches. But, you know, when I was living in Europe, I, I, was, I, I, I was like, oh, my gosh, I feel so closed in, so hemmed in. Mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, there's, there's no freedom. There's no big sky out there there's no you know blue this deep blue that i'm accustomed to you know the the lovely fleecy clouds are are they're lovely and all but oh i felt so homesick for the for the intense blue which we just take for granted unfortunately it's it's so true isn't it and i think it's because it, it's because it's just so clear because there's no other light pollution yeah. that the kind of blue sky that you get you know the it, it's that deep blue that's yeah. just so vivid that we we just yeah. don't get it over here I mean, not not only that we we don't have industry to, industry to speak of, so we have and we have a very low population. The whole state of New Mexico only has two million people, and it's what 120,000 square miles, which is I don't know how big is the UK. I think it's is bigger than UK, and, and we have two million people. And not only that, but the altitude uh, we're at 7,000 feet, over 2,000 meters. So the the uh, the cloud formations are much more intense. And and the the aridity, you know, I mean, we're we're on the border between the the uh, the open Chihuahua Desert, which is about an hour further south, and just behind us, the mountain ranges which go up to 12,000, 13,000 feet. So there's this there's this intensity to the the climate and the weather, which I, I miss so dearly. I mean, I love the cultural aspects and the castles and the good food of Europe, but that is what I truly missed when I was away. So definitely. Um, David, we, we're getting near the end of our time, but before we let you go, you know, you were um, one of the, obviously, the key researchers and developers for this right. trip, which we're talking about with um, with Suzanne, who's our next guest. Um, I just right. wanted to get from you, what was the most surprising and, I guess, satisfying aspect of the whole experience as you researched and developed <laughs> this, this particular tour? I, I tell you, the the uh and i'd been to the hill country in texas before and i'd been to san antonio before but uh on, on both those other trips i was you know i guess i just did a drive through the hill country i didn't really i didn't really hike it I, it was springtime which was so lush and lovely and you know new mexico is beautiful but we don't have the greenery that uh, at least the fresh spring greenery of the, you know, the deciduous trees yeah. that Texas does or that the hill country does. Um, the other portion I have to say, uh, I was so impressed with the area from Del Rio over to uh, Big Bend, which I had also been to, but again, I'd only flown in and I, I had not actually, you know, experienced all the, the hiking areas there and, and Big Bend, which I still want to go back to. And unfortunately, we ran into a, a situation with a, a fire, which kind of exploded overnight and, and prevented us from seeing portions of it. It was under control and it subsequently rained. I need to go back because I want to see it again. Yeah. Uh, two times, three times is not enough. Um, 
it's just a, a, a the spectacular, you know, huge canyon walls with the with the Rio Grande flowing through it. Um, you know, people looking like tiny specks, you know, <laughs> uh, in this massive, uh, uh, just incre incredibly massive environment. And the feeling that of a, of a with all these uh, problems with the border just kind of evaporate. Do we have immigrant problems down there? I'm sure we have some, but it it, it felt very remote from where we were, you know. And of course, the the areas of of southern New Mexico, Texas border area, Guadalupe, which I'd also been through a couple times, but actually hiking up into the the canyons, absolutely spectacular. Uh, uh, just take this this remoteness, this. Even though you're only maybe three hours from El Paso, it still felt so, so uh, uh, untouched by by um, yeah civilization. I guess you could say yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's, lovely. That's that's one of the things that I think is is really appealing about about this particular tour as well, and it's one of the reasons that we're delighted to be featuring it is that in the past sort of 15, 16 months, um, everybody's been stuck behind their damned computers uh, you know we haven't, right, right. we haven't been allowed outside and one thing that we're all starting to really yearn for now is to get back out to nature you know to to reconnect right, right. reconnect with with mother earth and get you know the technology's right. been great and we've you know it, it, <laughs> hey, it's kept us sane at times it's kept us connected but you know what actually we want to get back out to you know to, to mother earth and get back out to nature and i think that's what i think is the most exciting about this tour it's that that getting back out to nature as well as anything else right yeah. okay. so, but david that is that is all the time we've we've got right now um i just want okay. to say a huge uh, thank you to you uh, for your time and your experience and thank you indeed for um working with suzanne and the guys at 80 west on putting together what Great. looks like an absolutely incredible tour and um, obviously we'd urge everybody out there listening to um to check it out on the low season traveler website and um and yeah get get booking for next year all of the dates are available for next year uh, but david for now thank you so much i uh, wish you a lovely morning enjoy that, enjoy that lovely you. monsoon weather <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much take care again thank you so there you have it huge thanks again to david for sharing his insights with us today and please do join us again on thursday when we'll be joined by suzanne lorenz who owns and runs at west tour company Suzanne will be talking to us about her new tour for the region, which is called San Antonio to Santa Fe, National Park Treasures of Texas and New Mexico. It should be a great episode, and you can find out more information about the tour on our website at lowseasontraveler.com. And I must say the photos are absolutely stunning. If you haven't already done so, please do like and follow the Low Season Traveller pages on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn and Twitter to see all of our new latest content. And that's our podcast done for today. Thanks as always for your company. Have a great week wherever you are. Stay healthy, stay safe, keep your travel dreams alive and don't forget to share this podcast please with your friends, family and social networks. And finally, remember that now, more than ever, travel is better without the crowds. <laughs>